Hey guys, how's it going? I hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to another edition of Qlips. Today's episode features an interview with a YouTuber named Matt versus Japan. Now, Matt is an American, but he learned Japanese to a really high level. And in this episode, we talk all about how he learned Japanese, and he shares some of the things that he discovered in his Japanese language journey that can help you when you study English. So Matt's a really interesting guy, and I talked to him for a long time, and so this episode is a little bit long. So don't feel bad if you need to pause it or take a break and come back to it or listen to it multiple times. So I think there's a lot of good information here that Matt talks about, and I want you all to learn from this episode, as I learned a lot as well. So some of the things that we both talked about today were how Matt learns Japanese to a high level, and what the mass immersion approach, this is his website and his idea, the mass immersion approach, what this is. We talked about input, which is listening and reading, and also output, which is speaking and writing. And we discussed what's more important for language learning, input or output. I also asked Matt to share his three tips for Qlips listeners with us. So you'll hear Matt's three tips that you can apply to your language learning right away. We talked about the concept of adopting a native speaker as a role model for your language learning. We also chatted about shadowing and how that can be good for improving your accent, but it has to be done the right way. And finally, we talked about meditation and whether meditation could be helpful for language learning or not. So without any more waiting, let's just get right to it. It's a great conversation and I hope you enjoy it. Here we go, my interview with Matt versus Japan. Matt, welcome to Qlips. How are you? Oh, thank you. I'm great. How are you? I, I actually have a little bit of a cold right now, and our regular listeners, I think, will be able to hear it in my voice, but this is my first time meeting you, so I think <laughs> you probably can't tell. Oh, I, I might be able to hear it just a little bit. Just a little bit. I'm happy to talk to you, Matt. I've been watching your YouTube channel for maybe about six months now. Your channel name is Matt versus Japan. Yes. And could you briefly just introduce what your YouTube channel is about? Yeah, well, initially my YouTube channel was really focused on just how to learn Japanese because I, you know, spent five years pretty much fully dedicating myself to studying Japanese and I had pretty good results. So I kind of mm -hmm. just wanted to share what I had learned, help other people do the same. And as time has gone on, it's kind of spread out to more than just learning Japanese and kind of more just language learning in general. And I'm trying to, you know, make my content more accessible to people learning other languages. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's kind of funny that I came across your channel because I don't study Japanese and I've, I've never <laughs> studied Japanese before, but I do study Korean. And I think that a lot of the content that's on your website and on your YouTube channel is applicable to anybody studying a foreign language. And I've definitely found that some of the information that you've talked about has been applicable to me studying Korean. And so that's why I wanted to get you on here to Qlips so that you could talk about um, some of the things that you've learned so that our listeners who are learning English could maybe apply some of this to their own studies as well. Yeah, yeah, sounds great. So yeah, Matt, your Japanese is very impressive. We have a, a Japanese member on the Qlips team and I asked him, how is Matt's Japanese? And he was very <laughs> impressed. So you're, you're legit. And I was wondering if you could just talk about why you started to learn Japanese. What was your initial motivation to tackle this language? Yeah, well, I gotta say it wasn't the purest of motives. When I first okay. became interested in Japanese, I was just, you know, 16 years old. Uh, I was a high school student and I got into watching anime uh, okay. Initially, because, you know, I watched anime when I was a child, Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! At the mm -hmm. time, I didn't really realize that those shows came from Japan, but as I got older and realized that those, you know, my childhood uh, favorite shows were, com 
did come from Japan, I got more interested in that and started watching, and I just really liked how the language sound. I thought it was really cool.、Mm-hmm. And also, I wasn't so popular at my high school, and I, I think somewhere deep down, kind of subliminally, I thought, hey, maybe if I go to Japan, I'll be really popular. <laughs> and I think that was part of my motivation initially. Well, yeah, that's cool. That, that totally works. Whatever or wherever your motivation comes from is totally fine. It, it's interesting. Maybe Japanese people don't know this. I don't know. But in North America, growing up, we watched a ton of Japanese cartoons. Like all、oh, yeah. of the cartoons that I watched after school in Canada you know, were from Japan mostly. Of course, they were dubbed into English, but <laughs> there's a lot of Japanese content on TV. So. Probably you're not alone in that. There's probably a lot of people that have that initial start. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, of course,、uh, just to point, just to mention real quick, but my motivations、yeah. did evolve over time, and I kind of did、okay. grow out of that initial, you know, love for anime and thinking that Japanese people will like me because I'm, I'm foreign or something. But, <laughs> but gotta be honest where my roots came from. Yeah. So, it's really cool that you started learning. Japanese in the USA, right? It wasn't like you moved to Japan and then started. This was a completely foreign language to you when you started. Oh, yeah. I mean, I spent,、uh, like, I had a, a year or two where I was kind of just studying the way that, you know, most people try to study a language, like buy a textbook, go to class, and didn't really make that much progress. And then I came across this website called All Japanese All the Time,、mm-hmm. which、uh, was written by this guy who claimed to. I've gotten fluent in Japanese in just 18 months while、wow. living inside of the United States.、Wow. And he did it with this crazy method where he tried to immerse himself within, with、uh, Japanese as close to 24 hours a day as possible. And、okay. you know, he also combined that with using a spaced repetition system to study efficiently. And he had a, a bunch of other pieces of his philosophy. And so、uh, actually, I showed a video of him speaking Japanese to one of my Japanese friends. And、okay. my Japanese friend told me that he was legit. And so、okay. I was like, okay, let me give this a shot. <laughs> and I, I started trying to、uh, replicate his process. And so the first six months of, of doing that, I was j- inside the United States. And then I went to Japan for six months for study abroad during high school. And then I came back and I've been in the United States ever since. Okay, wow. And so this all Japanese, all the time method, which I think you can refer to as AJAT, right? Some people、mm-hmm. call it AJAT. Uh, the AJAT method, how hardcore did you go into AJAT? I mean, the first couple years, I was pretty hardcore because, I mean, my mindset as a 16 year old was that I just wanted to replicate this guy's success, the guy who made AJAT. And so、mm-hmm. I didn't really know what was important and what was, you know, not so important. And so I just tried to replicate it to the T as much as I could. And so the guy said that he did it like as close to 24 hours a day as possible. So I tried to do the same. And so,、mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't actually do, I didn't go as crazy as he did, meaning like I didn't listen while I was sleeping or anything, kind of listen <laughs>、okay. to Japanese while I was sleeping. And, but I probably spent, you know, like maybe three to six hours a day, like actively doing something in Japanese, whether that was trying to read a, a book or just watch a, a Japanese TV show with no subtitles. And maybe like an additional hour, you know, going through flashcards、uh, using a space repetition system. And then also,、okay. I tried to keep Japanese playing in the background as much as possible while I was just, you know, making food or cleaning or, you know, taking a walk or whatever. Right. Really just trying to set up an immersive environment as much as possible, it sounds like. Yeah. So the first couple of years, it was probably like, I mean, I was listening to Japanese each day much more than I was listening to English, you could probably、okay. say. Wow. <laughs> so、I、that's a pretty secluded,、uh, secluded life. Okay. <laughs> so, I don't necessarily recommend or think that it's realistic for most people to, to re- like replicate what I did when I was 16. Yeah. But what I did learn is that, you know, that you, get what, you get out what you put in. And、right. so, you know, if you spend six hours a day,、uh, you know, listening to Japanese and, and working on Japanese, you're going to make at least twice as much progress as someone who's putting in three hours a day. And there's a lot to learn when you're learning a foreign language, especially one so different from your native language. So. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you there. And do you think your age was a factor learning so young? Like, I started learning Korean when I was maybe 24 or 25. I started.、Um, and I wish I had started when I was 16.、Uh, I think that I could have gone more hardcore at a younger age. Do you think that was a factor for you? 
I mean, I think it was a factor in the sense of I had very little like responsibilities and obligations. Yeah. And so yeah. that made a huge difference. I mean, when I was able to do study abroad, that mm-hmm. basically allowed me to just study Japanese literally all day because I had, when, when I was living in Japan, I wasn't actually receiving credit for the classes I was taking at Japanese high school because I didn't understand most of the material. So it was kind of hopeless. And so <laughs>、right. really, it was kind of almost like a six month vacation in Japan where I just got to study all day. And、wow. so, of course, that's not feasible for most people who have a life. So. Yeah, yeah, I wish I wish it was, but I think in my situation learning Korean, you know, I have to go to work and I have other responsibilities. And I think a lot of our listeners, too, they're trying to do as much English as possible, but yeah, they have families and careers, and it, it's really hard to do it. But yeah, I think we just have to try our best and get our practice in where we can. Yeah, I, I think it's important to, you know, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, right? Like, sure. Really. Don't try to compare yourself to other people on the internet or other friends you have, but try to be realistic about like how much time it's possible for you to put in day to day and try to slowly improve over time and try to slowly find more cracks in the day. You can fit in a few more minutes of listening or a few more flashcards and, and try to just incrementally improve over time. Totally. I completely agree with you there. Okay, Matt, I want to ask you about the mass immersion approach. So, this is your website, right? What is the URL of your website? Yeah, well, massimmersionapproach.com. Okay, okay. <laughs> and so, this is, you took this AJAT idea that you found on the internet and you've been developing it and making it into something that's a little bit different, which you've termed the mass immersion approach. Could you describe what this is? Yeah, well, so basically, almost you know, two years ago, I started. Being more active on YouTube and making videos about how to basically do all Japanese all the time. Because the website, if you actually go to the all Japanese all the time website, it's a bit of a mess. It's not very、yeah. organized. The, <laughs> I've seen it before, you know, yeah. The author has a very quirky writing style that turns off a lot of people. And there's just kind of a, a lot of craziness in there. It's hard to sort out the real gold nuggets that, that you know, are inside of it. And so、okay. I was kind of making videos trying to, you know, Take all those gold nuggets, present them in a way that was going to help it reach more people and fill in all the blanks that he didn't really explain. And、mm-hmm. as I was doing that, I kind of realized that there are a lot of you know, smaller improvements that I made through the process, through my own experience. Sometimes it was actually changing something for the better, sometimes it was just filling in a blank where he was just like, you know, Listen to Japanese all day, but he didn't really give that much instruction on, well, what kind of Japanese should you listen to? Like,、right. what should, your, should you listen to the same thing multiple times, or should you just always be listening to new stuff? There's like tons of questions people have that I had kind of worked out my own answers to through trial and error and you know, looking into other people's language learning methods.、Mm-hmm. And so it slowly shifted more and more over time into being something that looks, you know, that had the same fundamental principles, but were kind of slightly different. And Then I also met my friend who online he's known as Yoga, as really、okay. Lucas, so I call him Lucas mostly. But、uh, <laughs> okay. he was also a, a very accomplished language learner who had、uh, b e c a m e fluent in three different languages. And、uh, we started talking a lot and we agreed on a lot of stuff. And we also、mm-hmm. disagreed on just enough stuff to make talking about language learning really interesting.、Yeah. And we both kind of slowly started to kind of meet, meet in the middle about you know, language learning. and... Then we decided that we wanted to kind of start our own thing, like let go of, of all Japanese all the time, because that had so much of its own trappings. You know, like it, it had a certain reputation. It, it has, it's so extreme. It's, it's hard for normal people to really buy into it and apply it. And so we wanted to take the kind of the fundamental philosophy that works really well and present it in a totally different way that would be more applicable to a much wider range of people.、Mm. And that was why we decided to make the mass immersion approach. Okay. And I like the name, the mass immersion approach. It's, Thanks. It's a good name. Yeah. <laughs> part of the, I, I mean, part of it is that, well, there's a few things. First of all, we didn't want it to have a certain language in the name, like all Japanese all the time. Right. Because right, we that, want it to be、uh, applicable to people learning all languages. Sure. Also, we thought that approach was a little bit more open ended than method because. You know,、mm. we want to kind of b u i l t into the approach that it's kind of customizable. It's, e- it's easy to make it fit your particular situation. And then、right. also, the acronym is MIA, which is normally、uh, can also mean missing in action. 
It's just kind of a play on words because when you right. immerse yourself in the language, you kind of go missing in action from the world of your native language. So. Right. Wow. Okay. So you thought deeply about the, the name. That's cool. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's very fitting, the approach, because when you study or when you search on the internet for how to learn a language, you'll come up with just so many ideas and so many people just selling you bad ideas, right? Saying, this is how you can learn. You can be fluent in six months or something like this. And so the approach is a little bit different. It's more customizable to everybody and you can tweak it. I think that the flexibility is a really nice aspect of the MIA. Thanks, and yeah. I think the, the way I think about it is that there's certain principles about language acquisition mm -hmm. that are universal for any different particular method that is gonna be effective for people. Okay. And so that is what we really want to make sure people understand is how does language acquisition actually happen? Like what's going mm. on in the brain? Like what mm. are the fundamental mechanisms that lead you to end up being able to become fluent? But then there's a lot of different basically surface level techniques you can use to take advantage of that fundamental mechanism. And that's mm. what's going to be different from method to method or from, you know, approach to approach. And so it, it's kind of balancing in, in a way that there, uh, you know, some methods work and some don't work. And you can't say that one method is the best, but all the methods that are going to be effective, I think, tend to have stuff in common. And finding that is kind of one of our main goals. Very cool. So could you outline some of the main principles of the MIA? Yeah, so some of the main principles are that, well, first of all, it's really targeting people who are want to reach a high level in the language, like really become fluent. Okay. and. One of the things I think is easily misunderstood is that there's kind of a value judgment that we sneak into that, meaning that, oh, it's a, if, you, if you're not trying to master this language and become equivalent to a native speaker, then you're just a chump and you're wasting <laughs> time. We definitely don't want it to come across that way. Of course, everyone right. learns a language for different reasons, and there's value you can derive from studying a language at every level. Sure. But we are just targeting the specific audience of people who really do want to reach a high level because that requires its own kind of methodology. Okay. And so the methodology uh, that we apply to help you reach a high level is to first really focus on input and understanding mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. save output or, you know, speaking and writing for later once you have a really strong foundation in understanding. Okay. And so uh, put to put that another way, you kind of build your intuition in the language of what's correct, what's incorrect uh, through absorbing lots of the language through input and learning to understand it. And then once you have that intuition, that's going to guide you when you start speaking so that you can be able to kind of tell yourself whether you're, you know, sounding natural and correct or weird and funky. And then you can self-correct like that to a really subtle level. Right. Okay. So that's something that I wanted to get into a little bit more because, you know, a lot of people, especially a lot of English teachers, they will say, you got to speak from day one. You have to speak right away. And... I get this question a lot from our listeners is like, I can't speak, I can't speak English because I live in a, a country where there's no English speakers. And this is a big problem for me. And so we have these two conflicting ideas, right? One, one where the, you're being encouraged to speak from day one and the other problem where you can't output because you have nobody to talk to. But I think, especially at a, a lower level, you know, at the beginning level, intermediate level, it's probably not a bad idea if you just focus on listening and inputting. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think it particularly depends on what your goals are, because like I said, if you're hoping to get to a level where you can just go to the country for a month and, you know, ask for directions and order food on a restaurant, then, mm -hmm. you know, that's not a, doesn't require a very high level of language ability. Sure. And so maybe you do want to just practice saying some basic phrases out of a phrase book, right? And, mm -hmm. and practice being able to produce those things because that's all you're going to need. But like Good I said, point. if you're yeah. really hoping to get to the point where you want to be speaking fluently and native-like, then you're really not only wasting your time by practicing speaking early on, but you're actually potentially doing a lot of damage because mm. um, basically th there's a lot of different ways to explain this. But one way that I've been uh, articulating to myself recently is that um, every language is so unique and specific in kind of mm -hmm. unpredictable ways. Okay. So to give an ex example from Japanese, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in English, we might say, um, have you seen my phone? Right. Like, mm -hmm. let's say, you know, my friend comes in, I can't find my phone. Hey, have you seen my phone? In Japanese, sure. they would actually say, Kei tai shiranai? which literally means, do you know my phone? 
Oh, right? okay. Yeah. And that's just, why do they, why do we say, have you seen? Why do they say, do you know? I mean, there's no right. real rhyme or reason to it. Right. Language is kind of arbitrary in a way. But the important part is that n English speakers are always going to say, have you seen my phone? And mm -hmm. Japanese people are always going to say, do you know my phone? Right. And so what they're really teaching you how to do in more general language learning programs that have that philosophy of speak from day one mm -hmm. is they're basically giving you grammar rules and vocabulary and they're telling you to think in your native language and then use these grammar and vocabulary to translate that into something that appears to be your target language. But mm -hmm. if that is the approach you're taking, you're uh, kind of doomed to sound very weird and, un and unnatural and perhaps not be understood at all because if a Japanese person just thought in Japanese and thought, oh, have you, do you know my cell phone? Do you know my phone? And then translated that into English, we wouldn't really know what he was talking about. Mm. And so basically because language, human language is something that is so, uh, you know, patternized in this kind of arbitrary way, you have to basically already know how a native speaker would express a certain idea mm -hmm. ahead of time and express it that same way. There's not really a room for being creative. It's not like math where you can just apply a formula and deduce the answer. You have right. to know the answer ahead of time. Right. And so basically that just requires lots of input, right? Lots of absorbing the language to find out, okay, well, what do native speakers say in the, every, you know, realistic situation that comes up? Right. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, you know, we can see that happening all the time when we speak with people who are learning English as a second language. They'll, depending on what your mother tongue is, um, people will make certain mistakes in English when speaking English. And we know these mistakes are happening because they're thinking like their mother tongue language, right? They're thinking in that way, but applying it to English and it causes an, an error. Um, so yeah, I guess the way to start thinking in your L2 is just to get tons and tons of input and have it slowly remold the way that you think in the L2. Yeah, totally. Because not only do speakers of different languages express the same basic ideas in unique and different ways, but they also just express different ideas in the first place. Mm, like, you know, true. one example I like to give is in Japanese, there's this really funny word, kyakugire, which you might okay. literally translate to reverse anger, okay. which is basically where like, what say that, you know, you put a yogurt in the fridge and you're like, hey, Matt, don't eat the yogurt. Yeah. And then I go and eat it anyway, right? And the next day you're like, Matt, what the heck? Why'd you eat the yogurt? Uh -huh. Well, maybe I get angry at you and I'm like, well, why'd you put it in the fridge if you didn't want me to eat it, right? I like get angry at it to try to defend myself. Like right. that's called gyakugire, right? Because right. I'm obviously in the wrong, but I'm getting angry anyway. And so in right. Japanese, there's a word for that. It's like, hey, why are you gyakugire right? Why are you getting reverse <laughs> ang like angry? Right. And so it's like, we just don't have that word in English, right? So we would never yeah. think to say it. Whereas Japanese people say it all the time because it's just part of their mental vocabulary, right? Right, right. Yeah, totally. And I mean, if you were to learn that in a textbook, it it, it could be useful, you know, for somebody to point that out to you. But I think seeing it in the wild and just exposing yourself to people talking like that is probably going to be the best way for you to acquire that kind of um, vocabulary item or that kind of thinking. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's how I learned it, right? I was just watched yeah. lots of TV shows, lots of <laughs> read lots of books. I saw that used so many times. And then one, one day I was hanging out with my Japanese friends and it popped into my mind. And wow. now sometimes when I'm hanging out with my English friends, it pops into my mind and I... <laughs> wish they we had a similar word in English. <laughs> yeah, I love when that happens, when something just naturally pops, like a word in in the L2 pops into your head when you're speaking and you apply it for the first time. It's such a fantastic feeling. Yeah, and that's like basically if you get enough input, that will just start happening to you more and more. Like the metaphor I like to use is that we probably all have had an experience of, for example, when we were kids, you know, when they would always, TV shows would always have the same commercials over and over and over. And mm -hmm. a lot of times you end up memorizing this whole 30 second long commercial word for word. You can recite it back, even though you never tried to memorize it. Right? right. And that's because when the brain is just uh, basically a pattern recognition machine and when you just expose it to the same patterns long enough, it just sucks it up. And so if you watch enough Japanese TV shows or Korean TV shows or whatever, English TV shows, like your brain picks up on this, the, these set patterns, these expressions that native speakers always use in the same ways over and over. And then it just starts being natural for you to use it as well. It just pops up when you need it. So that brings up an interesting question. And that is repeated listening versus extensive listening. What do you think is a better listening approach to take like one podcast or one audiobook or one YouTube video and just 
repeatedly listen to it over and over and over again? Or is it better to, you know, just listen to tons of different varied content and not really piggyback over and over against uh, the same audio file? Yeah. Well, I think that repetition can be very mm -hmm. useful mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, if I'm sure we've all had the experience of like, if you're studying a foreign language, you watch the same TV show or same podcast twice in a row or three times in a row, you notice more stuff every time. Yeah. Right? yeah and so sure. it's by, uh, you know, take using repetition to your advantage, you give your brain a lot more chances to, to pick up more stuff. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, if you listen to the same thing like 10 times, you, you reach a point where you kind of have sucked up all you can suck up at right. your current level. Right. Mm -hmm. And also repetition can be extremely boring. Yeah. And you always got to be careful problem. playing, playing with boredom because, you know, none of us have that much willpower. So you've got to keep it fun and engaging. And so I try to take an approach where you have a balance between repetition and keeping new stuff. And the way I do that is that when, whenever, what I recommend to people and what I did was whenever you're sitting down and you're going to give something your full attention, like, Hey, I'm going to watch a movie with no subtitles and I'm going to try to really understand as much as I can mm -hmm. always do something new. But then after you've watched something actively, kind of put it into a folder later and mm -hmm. then, or, you know, put it on your phone. And then when you're kind of want to do a more passive form of listening, like, oh, I'm going to also listen to English or whatever while I'm shopping or while I'm cooking or cleaning, then that's a good opportunity to listen to things you've already watched once actively. Mm -hmm. And then you get more repetition, but it's not as tedious because you're not fully paying attention anyway. You're kind of multitasking. Sure. And then you kind of get the best of both worlds. So you kind of, I kind of keep a, every week I used to sw take all the things I had watched that week actively and then put it on my immersion pod that I called it, which was just this little okay. MP3 player just for background listening, basically, to keep it really easy. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. I, I read, I think it was on your website or maybe it was on the AJAT website about people that had a dedicated phone or a dedicated iPod just exclusively for... Uh, listening to Japanese, so there would be no distractions uh, with other content. And I haven't yeah, tried I that out myself. It. It's cool. Yeah, you recommend it? Actually, because yeah, because well, first of all, yeah, there's no if there's nothing but Japanese on in your MP3 player, yeah, and it's impossible for you to cheat, basically. Right. And also, you don't even have to make a choice, right? Because there's a lot of research on decision fatigue, which uh -huh. is basically the idea that you know every time you make a decision, you're kind of wearing down your decision making muscle. And right. then you make worse decisions throughout the day. And so if basically you have this th this immersion pod that I like to call it, okay. where anything on it is good, then yeah. you just put it on shuffle and you don't have to make a decision. Uh, and and yeah. also uh, one thing you can do now if you have some money lying around is if you get like a smartwatch, <laughs> okay. you, can use, you can use a smartwatch for that. And that's what I've been doing. It's, it's pretty cool because it's on your wrist at all times, right? So you can yeah. get like some wireless headphones and a yeah. smartwatch and okay. make it as easy as possible. Maybe that's a better idea because it's actually pretty difficult to find an mp3 player these days surprisingly <laughs> yeah for a while i used this little ipod nano yeah uh, the the one that had a clip i don't know what generation it was it was like 50 yeah. bucks on ebay but i used that for years oh it cool was nice um okay man i wanted to ask you specifically about some things that our listeners who are learning english could apply to their studies do you have like maybe three tips or something of things that people could start doing right away that would be a good idea for them to do? Yeah, well, first of all, if you don't regularly spend time consuming things in English, mm -hmm. like with, and when I, and I mean consuming things that were meant for native English speakers, like mm -hmm. it's okay to also use material that was designed for learners, but mm -hmm. I think it's also important to, from very early on, spend some like time very regularly with real English content. So like sure. real books meant for native speakers or real websites or real YouTube videos or, and it doesn't matter what it is, but the kind of the slogan is by natives for natives. So right. stuff that's, that's real and yeah. really, and you know, at first you might not understand very much of it. And that might be very difficult because as adults, we're all so used to being so competent and feeling like we know what's going on. So it's really hard to put ourselves back in that position of being a child who doesn't really know what's going on and who is missing so much and not understanding so much. Mm -hmm. But basically, you, you're never going to get to that point where you can understand everything comfortably without going through that period of not understanding very much, right? right. So you got to jump in the pool if you want to learn how to swim. Totally, totally. Yes. 
And so that's one big thing is like, I think that's really the most important thing is just consuming real content in the language. That's going to make the biggest difference. Okay. And then another really good technique that I like to use is using a spaced repetition system. Okay. Which, you so know, what like do you Anki mean or something. By that? Anki. Okay. So the most popular one is Anki, which is a, a free spaced repetition software. It's basically mm -hmm. a smart flashcard software where you can either make your own flashcards or you can download pre-made sets of flashcards that other people made. Mm -hmm. And the program basically has an algorithm that, that helps calculate when you should review what material so that your studying is as uh, optimal as possible. So that you're not wasting time reviewing things that you don't need to because you already know it well and you don't end up uh, forgetting things so that you have to spend more time relearning it later. Right. And, and so uh, well, the technique that I like to use is really combining the space repetition study with consuming real things in in the language and so okay. for example if you're learning english you could be reading a book in english or watching a movie with english subtitles mm -hmm. and then you want to wait until a sentence pops up with a word you don't know and then you take that whole sentence you put it on the front of the flashcard and then on the back of the flashcard you put the definition of the word you didn't know okay and this is just because uh, a sentence is a larger unit of meaning than a single word it's easier to wrap your head around it's mm -hmm. more natural it's, it, it's more similar to the situations we run into in real life because normally in real life we're dealing with sentences not individual words floating around <laughs> yeah good point and then uh, and so yeah then it, through doing this you you're now your active study is more integrated with your kind of real life use of english you know you learn whatever is relevant to you at the moment if you're into cooking and you're watching a cooking youtube video then you yeah. learn the words related to cooking and that uh i think it's really important to have you know your study and your real life in the language integrated so that they help mm. each other out as much as possible Absolutely, absolutely. And then maybe the last tip I would give is to try to use an English to English dictionary as soon as you can. Uh -huh. So for example, if you're a Japanese person, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to start by using a English to Japanese dictionary, right. but as soon as possible, you want to move on to using an English to English dictionary because uh, basically, especially if you're, if you're dealing with, if you're like, for example, your native language is Japanese, Japanese and English are just too different. And right. so when you're trying to read a Japanese explanation of an English word, there's a limit of how close and accurate you're going to get. Sure. Uh, and also, you're, you're re reinforcing this habit of connecting your Japanese, the Japanese part of your brain with the English part of your brain, when really you want your English part of your brain to kind of branch off and be independent. Mm -hmm. And so if you can learn to use English to learn more English, then you kind of get this feedback loop going, and your ability to kind of really comprehend the mechanism of the language, in my experience, it will uh, start to grow really quickly if you can get into the habit of doing that, even though it's difficult at first. And there are some, some fantastic uh, learner's dictionaries out there that I think people could use as a first step towards. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, I forgot about that. That's a, a benefit uh, that people learning English have that yeah. learners of other <laughs> languages don't because right. English is probably the most learned language in the world. So sure, like yeah. they didn't have a learner's Japanese to Japanese dictionary. They, they had yeah. ones for elementary schoolers, but those were a little bit too dumbed down. To right. really be useful but yeah so that's a really great resource you could probably start using one of the learner dictionaries from very early on so i definitely recommend that yeah i think oxford and cambridge and all the big dictionary companies they all make uh english dictionaries for language learners that have simplified definitions but they're still totally natural english sentences so i think that would be a good uh, first step towards making that transition to uh, an english dictionary for sure that's yeah, a good point totally Cool. Matt, there's a couple other things that I wanted to talk to you about, and we'll do this quickly because I don't want to waste too much of your time here. But um, the first is about shadowing. And I've heard you talk about this idea of adoption before, adopting a, a dad, a <laughs> adopting a parent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, could you describe what you mean here uh, by adoption when it comes to shadowing? Yeah. So basically... Well, it, it goes beyond just shadowing the, the idea of adopting a parent. It's kind okay. of the idea that, you know, whatever language you're dealing with, especially if we're talking about English, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many different varieties of English. Like mm -hmm. there's, you know, Australian English, New Zealand English, American English, British English. But even within like the UK or within the U United States, there's so many other dialects of English, right? 
Like yeah. people on the East Coast speak totally different than people on the West Coast. And sure. then even like if we're just talking about like Oregon, right? Like, yeah. you know, my dad speaks a lot different than my, than like, you know, my little brother does. And there's like, you can talk like a skater punk or you can talk <laughs> like a, a educated, sophisticated guy, or you can talk like a, a dimwit girl, whatever. Right. <laughs> so basically there's so many varieties of the language. And so this kind of, kind of poses a challenge when you're a learner, because of course you want to be able to understand all of it, but how do you choose what you want to replicate yourself? Right. Like how do you find yourself in English? Right. And so. The idea is that uh, if you just choose someone who you kind of resonate with, who, who you like the way they talk, and you try to be like, okay, well, when it comes to speaking, I'm going to try to imitate this guy, then that helps you. First of all, it's going to make your speech style more consistent, probably more appropriate for your age and style and personality and stuff. Mm -hmm. And also, it's like it, the smaller your target is that you're aiming for, the easier it's going to be to know whether you're, you're hitting it or not, right? Mm -hmm. So if your if your goal is I want to sound like a native speaker, but then there's this huge range of what it means to be a native speaker. That's going to mm -hmm. be quite difficult to know whether you're heading in the right direction or not. Whereas you're, if you're mm -hmm. like I want to sound like this guy, yeah. then it's a lot easier to know like okay, well I'm I'm good in these areas, need to work on these other areas. And so basically the idea is that you could find, for example, a YouTuber mm -hmm. uh, who makes videos of himself talking to the camera. Maybe there's hundreds of hours of him just talking to the camera. Mm -hmm. And then you would just start spending a lot of your time with English, just listening to this one guy. And then just by getting a lot of exposure, you'll passively pick up a lot of his quirks. But you can also make a conscious effort to try to pay attention to like, well, what words does he use a lot? How does he uh, use filler words? You know, like what, what, uh, you know, what intonation patterns does he use a lot? Mm -hmm. And then you can, when you speak, you can try to think of yourself as an actor trying to basically play this role. And that's <laughs> going to allow you to, uh, very quickly sound really natural in in the language. It's kind of like this hack to, yeah. to really s sound good. And then shadowing is basically a technique to kind of help you fine tune that where okay. you're basically listening to a native speaker in the language and then repeating it back in real time and trying to listen to the, dis the discrepancies between your voice and their voice. And mm -hmm. that can help you with subtle pronunciation things or intonation things or just rhythm and flow things. And so uh, I like to, so when you're uh, shadowing, and this is a technique that I think you should save until you're pretty advanced because mm -hmm. um, basically, in my opinion, pronunciation, good pronunciation relies very heavily on your listening abilities, right? Yeah. Uh, for yeah. example, uh, a lot of Japanese people learning English, when they first start out, they literally can't hear the difference between L and R. Right. So if yeah, I say right and light, they yeah. literally think that those sound identical. Yeah. And so that means that a, like to the Japanese untrained ear, those two sounds sound the same. And so when a Japanese person, if they were going to try to shadow and they were messing up L and R, they're not going to be able to tell they're messing up because they can't hear the difference, right? Right, So yeah. the whole idea of shadowing is that you're correcting yourself by hearing where you're when you're off the target, but yep. that relies on being able to accurately hear what the target is saying. Right. And just through getting lots of input in the language and building a high-level comprehension ability and intuition, you will your ear will naturally get more and more tuned. And so that's why I say in the beginning, you want to just focus on really tuning your ear through input and then later focus on on shadowing because shadowing isn't really going to help you that much if you don't have a really highly tuned ear. Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And the further that you go along in your language learning journey, you start to hear yourself when you speak and you're like, wow, that's bad. <laughs> you know, and I think yeah. maybe at that point, that's when you can start to fine tune things. But until if you don't notice it, then it's it's really hard to correct, right? Yeah, totally. Like the, the metaphor <laughs> I like to use is basically if you can't hear where you're off, then you're kind of like a blind person trying to draw a self-portrait, right? Right. Like, yeah. Because a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to get, <laughs> I'll have native speakers correct me to perfection, right? Right. And like, oh, I'll just have a native speaker tell me when I'm off. Well, that's really similar to, imagine the blind person trying to draw the self-portrait and someone goes like, oh, no, your nose is a little bigger. It's like. <laughs> It's like, that's not going to help him too much because he has no idea what's going on, right? Right. So that's why really you have to rely on your own ability to correct yourself. You need that intuition, right? Yeah. Like that native like intuition of what it's supposed to sound like if you want to have any shot in really getting there. Okay, cool. So finally, Matt, I wanted to ask you about, med <clears throat> excuse me, this cold. I wanted to ask you about meditation. Um, I, I think there are probably some links between meditation and language learning, and I've heard you talk about this as well. What are your thoughts on meditation and language learning? 
Yeah, well, first of all, of course, meditation can mean a lot of things to sure. like a lot of different people. Yeah. And some people are just allergic to the word unconditionally. And as soon as they hear it, they get really turned off. So got <laughs> yeah. it's like tricky territory. But yeah, yeah. basically, the way that I, uh, what I mean when I say meditation is, uh, well, one of the simplest ways to think about it is just training your ability to, to concentrate. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. also train your ability to just know what's going on in your mind, right? Like a lot of times we get lost in thought and we don't even realize that we're getting lost in thought, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you ever have had the experience of trying to read a book and you realize that you have no idea what you just read for the last paragraph, right? Yeah. That meant that your mind was doing something and you didn't know what your mind was doing. Right. And so the idea of meditation is just sitting down and training just like you would train a physical muscle to first of all uh, have a... Uh, higher ability to concentrate have more control over what your mind is doing and mm -hmm. then also just have more awareness of what your mind's doing moment to moment mm -hmm. and there's lots of really practical techniques that can just help you improve these very basic skills uh that um you know meditators have been working out for centuries and millennia and so when it comes to language learning i think that there's kind of there's some really direct benefits and then there's mm -hmm. kind of some like ancillary benefits so okay. the direct benefits are I think that especially at the higher levels of, of language learning, when you're really trying to, for example, like you're already at a high level of fluency, but you want to, uh, you know, make the gap between you and native speakers, you know, increasingly smaller. It really comes down to just noticing a lots of little, really subtle patterns and quirks about native speakers, right? Like okay. really noticing like, oh, when exactly do they use this word? And when exactly do they use that word? Like how exactly do they, do they mush the sounds together when they're speaking fast? Right. Right. And so um, I, I find that, you pick up a lot of stuff naturally just through osmosis through getting lots of exposure, but you kind of level out after a certain point and it's, and to continue to improve after you reach a high level, it's really up to you to go out of your way to notice these things. Mm. And so, uh, you know, the better concentration abilities you have, then of course the better, the more successful you're, you're going to be at noticing subtle patterns when you set that intention to, right? Like, mm. especially mm. when you train your concentration, it makes it easier to use your mind in the way that you want to use it. And so yeah. instead of just zoning out and watching a TV show, it's easier to hone in and be like, okay, for the, for the, for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to pay attention to how natives uh, slur their speech when talking fast. Right. right. Like you can really set a target and then notice, and then that can be very fruitful. And of course you can do this without training and meditation, but you're going to be more successful the better you can concentrate. Right. So if you get that and, focus up, um, then you can, like you say, hone in on some of these aspects of the language that perhaps you couldn't have without this kind yeah. of mental training. And another thing is that paying, a lot of times boredom can be a, a real issue. Like it was a big issue for me getting to this level of language learning where it's like, mm. man, just trying to notice all these subtle patterns. Like I can already understand it, but I'm still trying to find all the little <laughs> things. It was pretty boring and tedious, <laughs> right. but a lot of times uh, things are really boring because you're not really paying attention to them, right? No matter what you take, if you really pay attention to it closely, you're gonna find something interesting there. Even if I just look at my hand and I look at all the little intricate lines and patterns in my hand, right? And yeah. normally I would never notice. It's like, oh, wow, my hand's pretty intricate, right? <laughs> right. Anything is pretty intricate when you really examine it closely. Yeah. Like imagine if I had an actual microscope, how interesting it would be to look at my hand. Yeah. <laughs> and so basically training your attention, your, your ability to concentrate is basically kind of upping the resolution mm -hmm. on uh, basically your consciousness so that you're going to be noticing more. And the more you're noticing, the more entertaining it is the less boring it is and so it's useful in that way too okay and then the ancillary benefits that i was talking about oh, yeah, yeah, are yeah. kind of like also just the fact that uh it's easier to be gentle with yourself to not be hard on yourself like for example mm -hmm. if you uh you know try to go have a conversation with a native speaker and you didn't understand something they said and it was really awkward and and bad like i think most people go home feeling like really awful right they might you know, drag that on for days, just feeling like, oh God, that was so bad. I never want to speak the language again. I suck. Whereas when you kind of get uh, through practicing meditation, you, you can get some distance between those thoughts and emotions. Okay. And of course, you'll still have those emotions, but they won't really affect you as strongly because you'll just realize like, yep, I had a bad experience. I messed up. Now I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling embarrassed, but that's just an emotion. It's going to go away. It's all, it's a normal thing and right. I'm okay. Right. And that, that kind of mental resilience is really important, I think, on pretty much any pursuit, but definitely meditation, I mean, sorry, language learning as well, when you're going to yeah. have lots of moments where you just feel like you suck yeah. along the way. <laughs> yeah, not a few, many, 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 but um, yeah, that's really cool. I, I have been meditating not for very long, for maybe only three or four months, but I'm starting to notice some of these benefits that you talk about as well here. 
Um, so I would encourage any of our listeners um, to give it a try and to look into it a little bit and see if it could be right for you because I, I do think that there are some connections here and that it can help us be more focused and stronger language learners. And it's also nice just to do in the morning. It's a good way to start your yeah, day. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Matt, I, I'm going to wrap things up here. But before we go, I, I would be doing our Japanese listeners a disservice if I didn't let you give them a little shout out in Japanese. Could you say hello to our Japanese cool, cool. listeners quickly? あの、ま、日本人にとっては英語を勉強するのはものすごく難しいと思うんですけれども でもその英語でしか手に入らない情報とかいっぱいあると思いますし、ま、英語できるようになったらま、世界中のいろんな人々とま、繋がれると思いますから、ま、諦めずにま、これからも英語の勉強をま、頑張ってください。応援してます。